Hello, hello, and welcome to another edition of Heavy Hands. I am your host, as always, and I say that with some serious underlining, Connor Rebush. And with me, for now, is Phil McKenzie. (coughs) (laughs) He's trying to play on your sympathies, folks. Don't believe him. He keeps coughing. I made it back, guys. <laughs> I'm here again. He keeps coughing this at the what I get. strangest moments. I asked him what he thought about British imperialism in India, and he had a insane coughing fit. Man, I needed to save myself from that one. <laughs> you couldn't have just said your real opinion, which is that pretty good. You like it. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> it helped to bring civilization to the continent. <laughs> I'm glad continent was the word at the end of that sentence. I was fearing far worse. Um, uh, welcome back, Phil. It's good to have you. You were, uh, well, frankly, I think I found two stellar replacements. Um, so your your position on the show has become considerably more tenuous than before. I ha- it has to be said. I found first an English guy, which, you know, checks that checks that one off and then i found um just like a real ass in in zane simon which is like your other main quality so you're gonna have to hustle also to to justify your 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 long-awaited return to as heavy hands co-host until you can find some until you can find some way to surgically stitch uh, Kyle and Zane together to make the ultimate co-host. Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm safe. <laughs> sort of human explaining centipede. it to the authorities. You don't understand. <laughs> it, I needed the right mix of snark and Britishness. <laughs> meanwhile, meanwhile, poor <laughs> Kyle in the background will just be going screaming, "Kill me!" <laughs> Excellent. Oi, kill me. Um, <laughs> kill me in it. Yeah, and imagine how pretentious his taste in films would be. <laughs> oh my god, Ugh, horror films you've never heard of, and for good reason. <laughs> It'd be terrible. Um, well, good to have you back, Phil. I, I am happy to uh, to have you by my side, uh, figuratively once again. Glad that you're feeling better. Uh, for the most part. And uh, we've got a card to talk about. We've got two cards to talk about, sort of. And yes, we have that sensational <laughs> Walker vs. Hill um, <laughs> card. And unfortunately, the dreaded virus has moved one of my favorite things from me, which is my ability to gloat. I picked everyone right that I picked on 271. Mm. All my cowardice worked out. Mm-hmm. The chicken, and I was like, oh, I think Israel Adesanya is going to fucking out. And he did. Picked Taitu Vasa, and I picked Jared Cannonier. Mm-hmm. And I picked Hinato Moicano. Mm-hmm. And so did uh, I. You seem to believe that I haven't, but I did. And uh, just, the only way I'm to disprove me. sure you didn't. The only well, I certainly picked him on the Viva section, which is public, free, and publicly available as long as you have internet. So the only way to prove me wrong and Phil right is to subscribe to the Heavy Hands Patreon for three dollars a month, where you can listen to that and all of our other bonus episodes. Um, Listeners, do it, do it. Wait so quote himself to it and quote Connor to him. We uh, we both picked Bobby Green very confidently, so confidently that I I was getting a little nervous even at the time. But man, were we on the money. Uh, Bobby Green mm-hmm. absolutely styled on Nasbert Hockprost. And I'm happy that we sort of had the chance to talk about that. Because Zane and I had a good time, but I, I could still talk about it more. In relation to this. Because now, a week after that fight, uh, in which Bobby took virtually zero damage. A small cut on the nose, I think, is all that he really sustained. And uh, will probably still be in something close to... Uh, good fighting shape has stepped in on short notice to replace Benil Dariush, uh, who, as a f- frenemy of the show, Suram Morala um, Daram, I know I always say his last name wrong, as he said, uh, injured his leg from carrying this card. 
Green Makachev. Very true. Is uh, it's good. You know, it's good and it's bad. It's a it's a terrifyingly compelling, uh, an event in its own way. Because I think almost everyone is united in wanting Bobby Green to pull the upset. Absolutely, he's having his moment, man. He's having his 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 Jorge Masvidal, Robbie Lawler, Sean Strickland. Uh, like late career journeyman moment where uh, not even journeyman, but you know, a young veteran moment where he's he's finally, uh, finally evolving into his final form. And uh, yep. he's out there with arenas chanting Bobby, Bobby, yeah. Bobby, and it's great. It's awesome. But uh, so yeah, there's so it's. But that's the thing. It, it is a, a sort of terrifyingly compelling main event because it's one of the ones where you you look at it and you're just like, you can win this. I don't know how much of that is genuine analysis and how much of it is just hope. Because mm-hmm. he is, I think, on the betting lines, he is some horrific underdog. Almost certainly too much because, um, yeah, Bobby Green is, is actually very good at MMA. Now let me have a look. Mm-hmm. Actually, you talk. I will have a look at the best. Oh, okay, great. This is great. This is what a co-host is supposed to do. This is what I miss most of all, Phil, is the dead air. That's, <laughs> <laughs> you're real. That's why I said you talk, and I didn't just go silent, as is, <laughs> yes, in many ways, heavy hands classic, yeah. when someone's like, oh, yeah, let me just check the stats. Yeah, we already and had then... a particularly long pause very <laughs> shortly after I <laughs> reintroduced you to the audience. Uh, which I am not going to edit out because that really is a heavy hands classic in my <laughs> mind. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, Bobby Green should not be a massive underdog. In many ways, he seems like a tough matchup for Islam Akachev. I think the the real downside is just that it's short notice is that um, I'd be perfectly happy to see. I know that some uh, some bafflingly devoted heavy hands listener by the name of like uh, Tariq Abu Sharipov is going to be very <laughs> is going to accuse me of lying when I say this. I'd be very happy to have Islam Makhachev fighting for a title. He's a super compelling fighter. Mm. He's really good. But man, is it going to be a weird series of asterisks uh, contributing to uh, contributing to to that uh, that result if if this results in a in a title fight for him? Like Dan Hooker was on short no- notice. Bobby Green on short notice. Um, you know, Tiago Moises, Moises did is, not have the world's yeah. greatest reason to be ranked. Exactly. A couple of fortuitous wins, but anyone who looked at that fight was like, obviously, Makachev is going to win this. Um, it's just not the most compelling path to the title for an, uh, unfortunately so for, for a very compelling fighter. But, um, you yeah. know. This is still an interesting matchup for what it is. And uh, you were looking up the odds. What What is Bobby Green sitting at right now? Uh, he is, I believe, around... He's around plus 500. You believe? Makachev is around minus 600. You believe? I just gave you five full minutes uninterrupted dead, dead air to look that up. This was a... This, uh, the, 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 the odds I've got are from a day, a day ago. Okay. And also, uh, when I look up odds, it tends to give me British odds. Uh, I, would, I can have, I can give you other places where I can say he's favored at com. twenty-seven to naught. Yes, <laughs> something like that. As uh, Islam Makachev at one to eight, and Bobby Green at five to one. Mm. Well, and so I mean, crazy prohibitive odds. Yeah, like, I those are those are well out of line. I agree. I don't think there can be an outcome up to and including uh, Makachev doing exactly what he did to Dan Hooker, which will make me think that those numbers are justified. Yeah, I tend to agree. Um, Bobby Green has a lot of things in his favor as an opponent for Makachev. A lot of things to consider. He is historically basically impossible to have sustained wrestling success against. 
Um, frequently, people do manage to rush out the gate and get him down quickly or run him into the fence quickly. That, uh, as you said, could easily result in a um, a lopsided instant win for Makachev. But uh, that usually doesn't work for long. At least it hasn't in the past. Um, Alain Patrick ran him into the fence and instantly got taken down in return. Clay Guida took him down quickly and instantly got reversed and then started getting fucked up in the clinch. Way back in Bobby Green's UFC debut, he fought uh, fan favorite Jacob Volkman and um, got his back taken in round one, survived, and then both outgrappled and outstruck Volkman for most of the rest of the fight. Um, he is a very savvy defensive grappler. He's this, – this is a thing that could go either way. He likes to outgrapple people who outgrapple him. That's some of that Mosfidal thing, right? Can be a good thing. Can be a very bad thing. Could easily be a bad thing here against Makachev. Uh, but it often results in people getting discouraged. And that's this is the real thing with Bobby Green. He himself is like virtually impossible to discourage. You You can frustrate him or distract him. But he doesn't, as I believe Dan Hooker did when he got hit and instantly taken down, he doesn't get scared out of making good tactical decisions in whatever situation you throw him into. He is always adjusting and trying to progress. Here, here, there's a moment, um, one of the few moments in Hooker Makachev, which I wanted to bring up that's kind of relevant to that point, uh, where Makachev gets Hooker down. He's in half guard. He's threatening a Kimura very clearly. He's already reached for it once. And Hooker does the first step of defending perfectly. He, he, he drives the hand that's being threatened through the armpit and has a deep underhook. But instead of like locking his hands and getting like a body lock, which maybe he could use to leverage out of his half guard into a better position or at least force a scramble, at the very least defend his arm. He just sort of keeps it there and starts like fiddling with Makachev's half guard. I just think he, there's too much on his mind at that moment. And this is the kind of thing Bobby Green does tip, typically does not do. He will focus on whatever the big threat is that is that he will occupy himself with beating it. And then he will try to create. And here I'm going to reveal just how much chess I've been playing lately. Counterplay. Uh, he will try to leverage that position to his advantage after dealing with the threat. Very good defensively minded fighter Bobby Green who always then looks to use his defense to create offense. He doesn't uh he doesn't do what we talked about like um Edmund Shabazian and uh who else was it a couple weeks ago where it's like or and Shafkat Rachmanov, he doesn't do this thing where he's constantly gambiting like I'm going to disregard your threat in order to go for a threat of my own. Um Usually, Bobby Green will address the problem first, and I think that is a very strong point in his favor in dealing with what is likely to be some serious wrestling success from Makachev early. And it's after that first round that I get very interested in how this fight continues to play out because I don't know to what extent Makachev depends on having a role uh, against fighters, which tends to be how he wins. Just sort of a, a snowball effect. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's the that's the plus and minus of Makachev, because he's managed to have sensationally controlled performances mm -hmm. in a uh, division which is historically quite hard to control. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Thiago Moises, Dan Hooker, and so on. These are, you know, these are pretty uncommon fights to have. In, and I think, you know, we, we've mentioned this before, in that this is just not how lightweights win fights. Right, except for Khabib. Yeah, I mean, even and even Khabib, it was more a sense of the opponent simply getting overwhelmed than it was, um, it was necessarily like, 
them getting steadily taken apart. Right. In the, he, he didn't. He hasn't really had. And I, I guess maybe the um, Alia Quinta fight is closest to like the thing, the the same kind of performance that you have had against like Moises. But I think he is. I think he is a controlled fighter, and. The thing is that we haven't really seen anyone break that control. The only time we've seen him, like particularly, particularly broken, is, um, well, I mean, is when he got knocked out. Yeah, which is very difficult. He to has draw. had competitive fights. Mm-hmm. His only and his only real competitive fight, I think, other than that, is uh, Tarukian. Tarukian, yeah. We'll also, be talking about today. Yes. Um. I think I think most of that all says like most of what we've seen just all says good things about um Nakjev. It's that he is uh is just brutally consistent. Mhm. Um I you know because there was there were reasons to be worried against the in the hooker fight. Uh you know Hooker is someone who's good at hitting level changes. He's a very he's a big finisher, he's a big jabber and he just got like just got thrashed. Mhm. So there is, uh, there's obvious reason to be concerned that yeah, as you said, Bobby Green will probably give up early takedowns. He may well uh, get forced to the cage, taken down, and give up his back like he did to Guida. He probably he will put if himself he gets taken down. Yeah, yes, because he did this repeatedly in the Guida fight. Yeah, He's turned his back to his knees and stood up. And there is a significant chance he's going to get his back taken and he will get put into bad trouble. Either he will get submitted or that will simply be an absolutely definitive borderline 10-8 round in the bank. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, Jeff is someone who is a very well-schooled striker and a good wrestler without necessarily looking like he's completely stoppable in either area most mm-hmm. specifically like on the feet obviously he did way better on the feet against Tiago Moises than Bobby Green did but that's a sort of seems like an artifact of how three of them fight yeah uh Moises is really gonna like just trail the cage looking to counter people Bobby doesn't like to move and throw yeah Likes relatively, he likes relatively stable, uh, relatively stationary uh, opponents to throw against. Mm-hmm. And, and meanwhile, who, like Makachev is he, a people who give him something a, to work with too. Like uh, so much of Bobby Green striking is about giving you a, f- a false sense of uh, opportunity, hanging mm-hmm. the hands down, sticking the head forward. He wants you to bite so he can play with distance and and counter you and. Uh, and, and make you fall over yourself reaching for a target that isn't actually as available as you thought it was. Moises so doggedly insistent on countering that uh, I just think a lot of the Bobby Green tricks didn't work. I still don't think that's a matchup that Bobby Green couldn't adjust to and do way better. I think he has but it yeah. in him to fight against type a little bit and win a fight like that, but uh, win it very com- confidently and completely. But yeah, I agree. It's a style matchup thing. But, I mean, it's also an interesting point, right? Is that, so... The... You know, the, the point worth considering is that, you know, you've mentioned, and, you know, something that we've had on a bunch of times, is that the 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 vet, the vet the young veteran, when they become sort of the middle-aged veteran, eventually realizes, you know, this is about as good as I'm going to get. Uh, let's just go for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Masvidal Lawler question for green is really like is is like his are his last few fights really are they just style matchups or is he literally stepping on the gas more Mm -hmm. i think it's a and it's an interesting question worth asking you know I tend to take the cynical approach. I would say that they're mostly just style matchup issues, but I do think that he is actually being—he is actually genuinely higher paced than. I mean, he's certainly higher paced than he used to be, like back when he first came to the UFC. 
Yeah, I mean, he's he still out did I mean, outpace Moises. Um, he's he, you know give, given an empty fight, he 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 typically puts up at least one hundred and fifty strikes in a fight, at least. Um, and given a, an opponent who who is in his face threatening him more, sometimes that much in a round on on a pretty regular basis or close to it. So yeah, I, it's a bit of both. It's a bit of both. I think I think Bobby Green would have had a much harder time with something like the the Fiziev fight, where he notably came forward a lot in the third round, and that gets at something else that I think is particularly interesting here. Um, Bobby Green has got to be the best, most reliable, like tactical adjuster that Makachev has fought to date. This is yes. the this is the really interesting. Um, element of this fight uh, given that Makachev tends to get on a roll against people and the same things keep working and then he can build on them. Uh, the same things don't tend to work on Bobby Green over and over. The same takedown doesn't tend to work. He will going way back to that Volkman fight. I think this isn't, this is a thing Bobby Green has always had. Um, Volkman surprises him with the first take, and I think it's a double, and then he uh, runs around to the back and finishes it from the angle. And then that controls most of round one, despite having a small sample size to work with, you know, getting taken down and controlled for most of the first round. Volkman's first attempt of round two is the same idea, and Bobby Green just, like, re resets his feet and, like, peeks out and reverses the takedown with ease. Um he is a very thoughtful fighter who will uh, make pointed adjustments to the things that work. Now, yeah, it's, it's interesting. That doesn't mean he's going to win because Makachev himself is a real, like, again, he is going to build on the things that work, and he's going to try to do that at a faster pace than Bobby Green can adjust and ideally having the initiative, you know. The, the advantage of, of being the guy who's, who's getting adjusted to is that you can, you can then be a step ahead of the adjustment as long as you expect it. But, um, yeah, you just don't tend to take Bobby Green down with the same takedown over and over. You don't tend to hit him with the yeah. same strike over and over. You have to be really, really on point um, connecting all these things together. And even then... It results in a lot of fights where Bobby Green fans are justifiably pissed that he lost the decision because he, he always mm -hmm. ends up doing a lot of good work, win or lose. So. And, the, yeah, there's a lot of things that he's good at changing levels with his strikes, which is obviously something which can work. You know, essentially, he's... He's good at playing off uh, the opponent's jab, and mm -hmm. he's good at changing levels with his with his own strikes. Mm -hmm. These are two things which which can potentially, if he fights Islam Makachev over five rounds, like could work very well for him. If he's just constantly throwing like long rights to the body whenever Makachev tries to jab with him, um, then that kind of thing could potentially make Makachev very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It's the main thing is simply that that tendency to just go onto his belly and get up from his knees. Mm -hmm. I think that is the only thing which gets me really concerned for this fight. Yeah, he also likes the guillotine. Obvious, yeah, as a defensive technique. Although he doesn't, he almost never drops for it. So points in his favor. He's not Dustin Poirier or or uh, uh, or Nick Lentz. Uh, or even Dan Hooker, he'll tend to threaten the choke and then use that to basically turn it into a front headlock and escape the position. So that's that's certainly better than thinking you've got the guillotine and then gambling the rest of the round, if not the fight, on that decision. Yeah, but Makachev and, will uh, will give his neck um, going for shot takedown. So there's an opportunity there at least to just create a better position by threatening the guillotine that Bobby Green does really consistently. You were saying, um, you know, there's also the, um, you know, it, it's the five round question. Bobby Green has tended to come on 
I don't think he, he doesn't have bulletproof cardio. Uh, you know, the things like the Venata fights, mm-hmm. they were very sloppy. Um, they were at an absolutely torrid pace. Um, but he is, he does also tend to come on strong. Mm-hmm. It's the fight to go on. Um, obviously, for Zeev. Um, I mean, it really is one of those ones where it just comes down to whether Green can make Makhachev miserable. Yeah. Like, if he can get him into a, into a fight on the feet where Makhachev is, doesn't know when he can jab, I think Green can have surprising success. Again, that, that, it's insane to say that Bobby Green should be the favorite in any way. He lost to Thiago Moises and... Makachev beat him handily, and Makachev is in is a undeniably an, a very high quality fighter. Mm-hmm. But five hundred, six hundred odds, even on short notice, is I think completely crazy. I agree. Um, just to just to piss off that uh, the fan I mentioned before, I'm going to pick Bobby Green. Um, really just in the spirit of not being a coward, you know, I think we, we, there were some opportunities to learn the lesson of not sadness hedging at every opportunity last week. I, uh, picked Israel Adesanya and was only right because of an egregious robbery. (laughs) Just kidding. Oh yeah. (laughs) And, um, um, yeah, I, I just, uh, I see a good way for this fight to play out. At the very least, if it's not an instant finish, which could happen, seems perfectly likely, Bobby Green's probably going to get taken down very quickly, uh, and then have to deal with that. It's a far more resourceful, creative, and also along with that, on a bedrock of sound technique. Uh, opponent that Makachev has faced yet. Bobby Green is is truly a different blend uh, of 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 skill sets and a different style of fighter than we have seen Makachev beat so far. In in several ways, uh, I think he is uh, just as well suited as Dan Hooker, if for slightly different reasons, to make Makachev miserable if he can uh, get this fight on the feet. Um, the other thing I didn't point out, Bobby Green, uh, I agree, maybe not rock solid cardio, although he tends to recover really well. He stays very calm and, uh, and you can see him like after a hard first round going back to his corner and gasping for breath and then he'll fight pretty competently for the rest of the fight and seem to show few effects of that unless you can keep, as you said, a torrid pace nonstop like Lando Venata, just making him exchange, making him wrestle nonstop again, could happen, he tends to deal with uh, his exhaustion well. That couples with the fact that Bobby Green, especially against wrestlers, tends to be a really consistent, attritive striker. He uh, he doesn't always hit the body a lot, um, like in examples of where opponents just sort of plod forward and give him their face. Nasrat Hakbarast, even another wrestler, Pat Healy, mostly headshots in that fight. Um, but against guys who threaten level changes, guys who uh, actually take care to defend their head, um, which Makachev certainly is one, guys who use their jabs and, and, and try to play takedown threats off of those, he tends to hit the body a lot against those guys. And he also hits the legs a lot. Could be a problem. Dan Hooker got taken down on his first leg kick attempt. But uh, I'm just really curious to see how this plays out. I, I can't think of, a, of another fighter in the division um, better suited to have things go terribly and then surprise Makachev by not folding. Uh, and, and more than not folding, coming up with progressively better solutions over the course of the fight. I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to see that. And I'm going to, therefore, make a hope pick that uh, Bobby Green shocks the world. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very, I'm actually really tempted to join you. Um, 
Dunno. Um, you got to justify it either way. We've, we've never. We, we haven't really seen what Akachev looks like in a tough striking battle. The only thing we really know is that he doesn't have a bulletproof freak chin. Yeah. I think that really matters against Bobby Green that much. Because I think, yeah. as I said, it's going to be a question of whether he can be upset or not. Um, I think Makachev does have pretty good cardio. I mean, even the, Mo- the Moises fight was just very controlled. I don't think that really matters. But I think that's the Tsurukian fight. Mm-hmm. Really one of the most absolute physical... Uh, is the most... Say it's probably the most physical wrestling match we've ever seen at lightweight, but yeah. with the possible exception of like, uh, he bow, uh, uh, Khabib, just like two guys, just who both extremely strong and extremely skilled wrestlers, just locking up and going at it for uh, just three rounds, mm-hmm. and. Makachev still looks pretty strong by the end of it. He still looked yep. like he was fully, you know, going for wrestling. He he looked he was tiring Sarukian out rather than vice versa. Yeah, and, and Sarukian Saruk- was doing I mean, in that fight something that Bobby Green himself will probably do at least to an extent, which is you start out wrestling him, he is going to want to teach you a lesson by out wrestling you. Yes, which. More so than against basically any other wrestler he's fought, probably a bad idea <laughs> against Makachev uh-huh. in the balance. Could work in spots. Could be great little moment momentary decisions uh, just to make Makachev think, um, and then disengage or come out the next round with a different approach. But it could very easily put him in trouble and lose him the fight, as it did Sarukian. Despite all the success he had, he ended up being a victim of his own success in the wrestling. So, I mean, I, I think, unfortunately, it's, it's the two things. It's Bobby's tendency to give his back up in, in exchanges, and the fact that, like, Magachev just has a just has a really good gas tank. Yep. And I think he's, he doesn't he doesn't tire himself out with his own game. I think if I think Green can tire him out on the feet, if it's just popping him a bunch of times, I think Magachev will have a miserable time of it. But I think he's he's going to be perfectly happy to just run Green into the fence whenever he can. And if he duplicates that Sarukian fight for three rounds, then he might get in trouble in rounds four and five. But Bobby Green would also be very tired by then, especially on short notice. So, yep. I'm yes, once again, I'm going to be the coward, I guess. I'm going to pick Makachev. No I'm one's not surprised. Happy about it. No one's surprised. doesn't matter you're not happy about it. You know, you think that gets you off the hook, Phil? Oh, I made the decision, but I'm not happy about it. Shut up. <laughs> pick Bobby Green, goddammit. Yeah, it's. I think that's probably the right pick. Um, Makachev, uh, perfectly justifiable favorite, should probably even even be a pretty solid favorite, if not quite to the extent that he I mean, he, he should be is. like... It should be like minus 250. Yeah, absolutely. Like... Something like where you're like, oh yeah, that's a solid favorite. But this is, but it's just been is, a little weird to get are here. Weird, and and, and yeah. the path to get here has just not been. There's Makachev is one of those fighters you can see, despite uh, level of competition or whatever. Like Chimaev, you just take one look and you're like, oh, he's obviously very good. Like he's going to have a step mm-hmm. up and he's going to do great. And so far that has been the case. But they have been strange steps up, and. Yes. You know, the Tsurukian fight, great, shows his toughness, um, his his determination, and, of course, his wrestling skill. Um, but also, you know, like Tsurukian, a prospect, very inexperienced. Um, and that was his first step up. And then Dan Hooker, short notice, ends very quickly. Would have loved to see more out of that. Again, credit to Makachev. You can't take anything away from the guy um, for all of these wins. But uh, Bobby Green is interesting, man, and he's not easy for anyone to beat. When has Bobby Green ever been beaten easily? Has it happened? In Poirier, that was... Yeah, and even that one. He's got plenty of moments. Yeah, even that one. It's, it's a scrap. It's just, you know, he gets finished early. 
So this this could be the grappling equivalent of that, uh, where Bobby Green makes some crazy dynamic things happen and then gets finished on the ground. But um, barring that, we're in for a very interesting fight no matter who wins. And uh, it just sucks that if Makachev wins, and I, I still think justifiably gets a title shot out of it, um, it's it's going to be like you're going to have to ask, well, what if Bobby Green had a full camp? Not that he was going to like super carefully game plan or anything, but it's a question of fitness. And that's the thing is that, uh, and it's also like, you know, you mentioned Chimaev, but Chimaev is also very clearly a men's physical destructive force for the division in a way which right. isn't. Agreed. So you're always getting the question, this sort of feeling that Kachev is riding this. Uh, he's riding this technical line uh, where he's just a very, he's just a very skilled fighter. Which is awesome. And, but at some point you wonder when will he have to fall? You know, at some point every great UFC champion at least has, has fallen back on the fact that they have yeah. outrageous physical attributes to back, back all their skill up. Yeah. Um, and it's just a question of like, does he either like, can he just continue to outskill everyone because Bobby Green is a very tough ask? Mm-hmm. So that's me courageously picking Bobby Green, Phil, failing you all and me and his first first show in what has it been four weeks or something? It's been so long, and uh, yet he's not afraid to disappoint. Thanks, pal. You know? <laughs> Let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the aforementioned Armand Sarukian. He's fighting Joel Alvarez. And uh, then uh, Alejandro Perez versus Jonathan Martinez, another interesting undercard fight. A sort of um, marginally typical bantamweight versus a true anti-bantamweight in Perez. That one's got some interest for me. And then after that, we are going to um, take a look back at uh, last week's mess after this. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like. And in return, you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. All right, welcome back to Heavy Hands. Once again, I'm your host, Connery, but with me once again is a uh, man I've now decided to start calling from here on out, Dead Air Phil McKenzie. This is going to be my new jibe, Phil. Is, is <laughs> truly one of my favorite things about talking with you on the podcast. Is you're totally unafraid of long silences, <laughs> letting me swing in the breeze as you are right now. It's just sort of talking to myself, really. So anyway, <laughs> we are going to talk about. An undercard fight from this upcoming card. This is essentially, I, I'm quite sure that when I talk about this tomorrow with Zane on the Viva section, there, there will be at least two other fights of which, having actually looked at them, uh, I'll be like, yeah, this is a good matchup. I like this dynamic. But uh, as far as the at-a-glance metric is concerned, it's a three-fight card at best. Um, and we're going to talk about the other two. So first up, is uh, Armand Sarukian. We talked about him plenty uh, in relation to his uh, really promising defeat at the hands of Islam Makachev, uh, which was ultimately just kind of like a young gun versus OG type of matchup. Um, huh. And one where he comported himself really well. They've just been feeding him grapplers ever since then, which is kind of frustrating. Um this is a thing that the UFC just does consistently. They, they weirdly, despite the origins of this sport and this promotion, err on the side of uh, avoiding like major style clashes. 
um, not even in the terms I like, like pressure fighter, counter punch or whatever, but like uh, striker versus grappler. And uh, not that those are always the best fights. Um, maybe Turkin would have, but but Turkin likely would have gotten like a big win if they just given him like some respected but poorest striker that he could just do his complete MMA game and dominant wrestling style against. Um, he's there taken... are cool striking tracks which will get you to a title shot quickly. Yeah, and there are slow, horrible grappling tracks where you can just get sidelined into absolute oblivion. Yeah, and people just like don't care about your fights because, um, you know, you're you're winning very impressive grappling matches, which are never going to be as just flatly impressive on the surface as very impressive striking matches. Um. They're just not as violent. But Sarukian has won some very impressive grappling matches, and that seems like a really strong point in his favor here as he takes on Joel Alvarez, who is, I think for both of us, Phil, uh, sort of our least favorite, uh, not to speak for you, certainly my least favorite kind of prospect, which is to say that he just keeps finishing people like instantly, and who cares? Like, I, I want some, give me some footage. Give me some back and forth. Give me some pushback. Um, but more to the point of this matchup, a guy who beat Alexander Yakovlev by going for a guillotine the moment he was getting taken down, conceding the takedown as a result, and then submitting him off his back. Could that work against a guy like Turukian? Maybe. But uh, he hasn't been out grappled yet, except for Makachev. He wasn't submitted. And he's always been pretty willing to grapple with people who are otherwise dangerous grapplers, uh, dangerous submission artists. So why should I not pick Armand Sarukian? Uh, yeah, I mean, the whole reason why you might pick. Uh, is it Joel Alvarez? I believe so. I think he is not Brazilian. Um, yeah, he's Spanish. Um, there you go. Joel you would pick him is that he is a giant man yeah that is also relatedly the reason why on this particular card i think this fight is in the weird position of being uh like second which is always a weird spot because the opener you know the opener is typically an action fight then beyond that the level of importance sort of increases as you go up the card Mm -hmm. why is this fight second i think this fight is second because uh, Joel Alvarez has missed weight catastrophically his last two times out. Oh, right. And they don't trust him, as they shouldn't. And they don't they don't tend to book people in, uh, like, super crucial spots if they don't trust them. Because uh, you would think, you know, he's had four straight cool finishes. He's up against a really fun prospect. Mm-hmm. This is, I mean, this is by far the second best fight on this card. By a mile. Easily, yes. It's just the fact that, like, uh, yeah, you, you just can't trust him to make the way. He's he's on the Lineker... Um, he's on the, like, uh, Lineker Oliveira track, where he's just going to miss weight. Every, you know, He's not for this weight class for very long. No, he's six foot. Th- he's a six foot three lightweight who isn't particularly who isn't particularly skinny with it. No, he's ridiculous. He's literally bigger than Darren Till, who wisely um, moved up in weight from welterweight. He's 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 far far too big for the division. I agree. So he's got uh, six inches of height on. Uh, Tsurukian. And not that much reach. Wait a minute. 77 inches, 72 inches, 5 inches of reach. That is a pretty significant size advantage in every metric. Uh, so that's why you might pick him. And and sort of like this this goes to also why I don't particularly like. Um, I don't particularly like Joel Alvarez. That he is a giant size bully. Is you look yeah. at his fights and you're just like, man, that guy's huge. Yeah, and he just tanks the other person's offense and tries to hit them, and he's just really, really big, and he he looks like a giant finishing size bully. Yeah, that's um, about it. Uh, he is like 
as as you can sort of see, he's he's good at it in a bunch of different ways, which might be a bit concerning. Um, oh, he's he's very violent on the feet. We've talked a bit about Tiago Moises, uh, you know, both in the in the Bobby Green and um, Makachev and Makachev contexts, and you know, both of them had. Tiago Moises he fights with him mm-hmm. uh, uh, Alvarez simply crushed him just smushed him instantly yeah. and uh, Rukian has the same thing that you could debatably say about uh, Makachev is that he's had pretty controlled fights thus far which mm-hmm. largely you know only uncontrolled fight the two of them have had with each, was with each other where I think you know it was it was almost like a role. It was so aggressive and wrestling yeah, based. Right. It was like those, um, watching so, those clips of like uh, Michael Chandler and Kamara Usman like flow wrestling, nonstop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and that's you know clearly their A game for both of them and where they feel the most comfortable. So if he gets stuck on the end of a huge guy's reach, he has a knack for counter punching, but he's not very defensively sound. Yeah. Um. He is a good wrestler, but it, it can still go wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the um, Christos Giagos fight, um, which was, again, against a very big, although notably not as big as jo- Joel Alvarez, because no one is as big as Joel Alvarez, uh, fight, he uh, kind of backed Giagos up, shot in on him immediately, and Giagos basically just killed his shot and fell on top of him. Mm-hmm. Like... Um, these are things that he can't really do to um, Joel Alvarez. Mm-hmm. Or at least he shouldn't necessarily do to Joel Alvarez. Again, he looks like a young super athlete who has no... who is unlikely to have many glaring physical flaws. He has great cardio. He's very strong. He's very fast. I think he probably has a very good chin. He looks like he has a really good chin. Um... It's like the sheer amount of like stocky muscle he has. Yeah, I don't yeah. expect him to get finished. Um, but the, the, there are knock is that like... he, he is himself not a great finisher. Typically, I mean, he he knocked out mm-hmm. Jagos, but he does not typically pack a lot of power. Mm-hmm. Uh, is not a very submission oriented grappler. But uh, he is really good. <laughs> Yes. You know, in addition to the physicality, which should hopefully make up for the o- normally overwhelming physicality of Alvarez, um, Sarukian is just one of the best, uh, has one of the most connected, complete games of any prospect right now. Um, I think it's fair to actually question whether or not you'd still call him a prospect, because he, he has s- more than announced that he belongs at this level with his last four wins, but... He's um, that is the real strength of Tarukian's game is how good he is at everything and how well he puts those things together. Um, and I just think Alvarez is just the size to 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 way too much of an extent for me to trust him. He, you know, we we both looked at his uh, his fight with Damir Ismagulov, a more fluid striker than Tarukian, more confident, just just better. Um, and probably a maybe a bit faster. Uh, although I think a lot of that is, is I think just they're probably about. I think they're probably about the same. Yeah, I think the I think, the appearance think... of being quicker is really that Ismagulov is just smoother uh, as a striker. Um, but uh, Alvarez looks like a lumbering ox for most of that fight. He's yeah, that was that was really what I was going to hit on. That's the the downside of him just being a a, a reasonably sized welterweight. That he is he's quite slow. Yes. He he is quite slow. And this this pertains to this this affects he's he's he doesn't have good defense to begin with. Uh he's an MMA fighter, so you know, you shouldn't be surprised to hear that. Um but it makes his defense, whether you're talking about wrestling or striking, worse. He people who can who can connect either their strikes to each other or their strikes to their wrestling attacks um, can get in on him. Even people who just run at him aggressively can usually get in 
and you know this results in things like the the finishes of uh, of Yakovlev and um what's his name Irish guy Joe Duffy but uh but you know it's not super surprising to see either of those guys getting finished in the way they did it would certainly be surprising to see Joel Alvarez be the first guy to just like insta sub Armin Sarukian so yeah. you you got to pick Sarukian he's 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 just a far more complete fighter he's one of the best athletes that Alvarez will have faced albeit just as small as every other lightweight in comparison um and yeah he's he's just a really complete fighter and Alvarez is um you know mostly duct tape it's mostly like just just the size the power uh these are band-aids covering up just a a host of flaws uh in his in his game I'm trying to think who he reminds me of like i'm sure there's been people like this. Manny Bermudez just sort of Maybe. Do you remember him? Someone who's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but there's definitely like some people who've just made careers out of being giant, um, like huge weight bullies. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think I, I tend to agree. You gotta, you gotta pick. Uh, you gotta pick Sarukian. Um, I think the the size difference is gonna look pretty freaky, but he is is a good wrestler. I don't trust Alvarez to be able to wrestle with him that much. Mm-hmm. I just think like Tarukian can also just kick him, kick him up from range. That too. Tarukian, like, like, I think he's been working on his boxing. He is a, he is a good counterpuncher. Although I don't, as I said, I don't necessarily love his defense. But like his main thing when he first came to the UFC was that he was like a, he was like one of the, he was like a kick grappler. You know, he would be a guy who would just throw kicks at people and and also just like grapple with them even if he wasn't necessarily um like uh aggressively taking them down the whole time. So I think he can just he can just kick Alvarez up a bunch from range and then just dart in and out. Yeah. Yep. I uh, make up the make up the sort of difference as a as a boxer um with um that he would have as, you know, that that Magulov had. Uh, with just like strike diversity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree, and also just the ever-present threat of a well-timed, well-set-up takedown hmm. uh, that doesn't just you know get him instantly submitted. So I will be, as I said, this is it's a genuine. I think it is a genuinely like interesting fight. I will be even also genuinely annoyed if. Um, Mugulov, oh, sorry, not he's Mugulov. Alvarez misses weight again, and it's somehow pulled off. Either way, I would be in. Just, if he blows it by like ten pounds, and they're just like, no. Yeah, it would be perfectly justifiable for Tsarukian to refuse. I, w- I would also just be, even if he makes weight, I will be annoyed if Alvarez wins because mm-hmm. <laughs> I just don't like his game. There's very little of it to speak of, and he really shouldn't be in this division. You say reasonably sized welterweight. I think even that is pushing it to an extent. I think this is the kind of guy he goes up to welterweight and probably misses weight again because his body is just desperate to pack on more weight because he has to be cutting a huge amount to make to well to even <laughs> sort of make 155. Uh so yeah. Tarukin all the way, both a heart pick and a head pick. I think he he's just the uh should be a well-deserved favorite. Okay, let's talk about some bantamweights real quick before we uh, we jump off this card, never to speak of it again. Uh, Alejandro Perez is fighting Jonathan Martinez. As I said before, Martinez, um, maybe not the typical huge puncher that seems to populate the uh, bantamweight division, although he is certainly a capable finisher, um, especially with his knees and elbows in close range. Uh, much more a classic bantamweight as opposed to Alejandro Perez, who is truly the if if bantamweight is AKA Perez is Luke Rockhold, like he he just runs completely counter to what tends to define the fights and fighters in this division. And um, you mean being exciting? Yeah, pretty much being a big puncher. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. 
Um, he is, I said to you before we started the show that he, he's, he's been, I, I actually said, I said supplanted, which sort of implied that I was ever like really into Alejandro Perez. I've always found his, his game to be a little suspect. I think it's, um, it sort of gives me like classic Jackson Wink vibes where mm-hmm. there's a lot of, a lot of him doing what I would call a good impression of a boxer. And then if you just sort of ignore what he's doing, there are a lot of ways to blow it up. Um, if you want to look at, a, in my opinion, a really good example of the sometimes frustratingly neutral but usually very sound, uh, like anti-pressure fighter right now, the, the heir to Rafael Sunsau, as it were, it's Chris Gutierrez. He's, he's the new uh, Asuncao or the new McDessey. He's the guy who, yes, you're going to see him lose some fights. You're going to get mad at him because he just doesn't turn it on soon enough. But he's always going to uh, solve the opponent, whatever they throw at him, at some point in the fight and make things very close and difficult as a result. Perez is a, a bit of a pretender, in my opinion, to that kind of fighter, where enough pressure, you can kind of just, the, the wheels start to fall off. So, uh, I I think I've, I've said this as well. I, I think he, for me, he's really like the Brad Tavares of this division. Mm-hmm. He's he's pretty hard to take down, uh, but like there's a level at which his takedown defense doesn't work. Uh, he's gonna have just a he can have like a tough low power kickboxing match with you. We'll do that. Mm-hmm. A bunch of low kicks, tough, but he's not like he can be be knocked out as well. Mm-hmm. He keeps a pace, but he can be outpaced. Like he is just the like really is like the sort of line for elite fighters in this division. Which kind of there's many very good, there's or at least very good fighters. Not the elite. I think he's the baseline for the very good fighters. There's unfortunately a lot of very good fighters at bantamweight. Yeah, he has a, a generally just a less stable position than Brad Tavares does. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's a lot more difficult in this division to just sort of leave that many holes. And um, so you know, I don't think Martinez is a is a uh, is necessarily the exact right fighter. Um, to, to just take Perez apart at the seams. He um, leaves plenty of open spaces in his own game, tends to uh, follow people around too much when he should be cutting them off. Um, he's a bit sort of static behind his high guard and quite upright. Uh, I think there's probably some room for Perez to have success with wrestling in a matchup like this. Um. And he's going to probably spend an awful lot of time. He's a very all the way in, all the way out kind of fighter, Martinez. Um, so he's probably going to spend a lot of time at a range where Perez likes to low kick people. But he is himself uh, a really consistent kicker and really, really nasty when it comes to uh, close range fighting. He's He's got some brutal knees in his arsenal. You could accuse him of overusing them, um, exposing himself too much looking for them. But uh, he has a very tall style of fighting that operates around uh, the idea of getting into the clinch and smashing people in the face with knees. And uh, I like that. I kind of tend to favor it. I just think Martinez is pathologically aggressive enough to uh, to rely on against a guy like Perez, who, who I will say, you know... Um, you, you know, there, there, there's always going to be asterisks when you beat a guy like Johnny Eduardo, but I think Johnny Eduardo, uh, against all odds, continues to be a quality win in this division. Um, you know, at least for a round, you're going to get a brutally tough fight uh, uh, against Eduardo. And um, Perez was at least more aggressive than I think I've ever seen him in that fight. Granted, it was against someone who was himself committed to counterpunching. That tends to be Johnny Eduardo's thing. 
But he did seem to take a lesson away from the, the losses he suffered in his previous two fights that he needed to actually take his fight to the opponent more. This unfortunately brings with it the fact that he is kind of a mess in the pocket. Um, so pressing forward puts him in danger a lot more. I think the reason he probably defaulted to his more evasive outside uh, counterpunching and kicking style is that his, his defense is quite desperate and improvised when he's in punching distance. So Martinez is not a great counterpuncher, but he can throw elbows. He'll grab clinches. He'll crash into you. I, I, I got to think that uh, Martinez is uh, is going to have the advantage any time they get into middle or close distance and is competent enough at long range to compete there. I think my main problem with Martinez, and I think... I will say, I think Perez is actually okay at, at punching in combination. Sure. Increasingly so. Um... And the one thing I that Tinez does is that he watches his work a lot. Yeah. And he gets hit and dropped a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, like, uh, Davy Grant knocked him out. Uh, Andre Sukumta mm-hmm. um, knocked him down, like, super early in their fight. Uh, he really does tend to just like throw a strike and then just pose. It's like, how was that? Yep. Good, wasn't it? And then he, he sometimes he just gets absolutely clobbered. Yeah. And then to run backwards with his hands up. I think Frankie um, Signs might have hurt him early in their fight too. Yeah. I mean, so he he does get hurt a bunch, but obviously, you know, it's Alejandro Perez. Alejandro Perez doesn't really hurt people very much. Yeah. Um. Oh, I'm I'm gonna pick Perez. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just think, like, Perez at least, m- m- apart from the um, Song Yudong fight, which I think is anomalous because Yudong is a giant puncher, this is very tough. Mm hmm. I agree. And it's just, I, the problem is, like, I don't think Martinez is a consistent round winner just because the image of him getting caught is so bad. Yeah, it's true. Then, and he isn't hurt badly because, as I said, he gets caught taking a picture and then he has to scuttle backwards with his hands up. It's true. Even a relatively mediocre puncher like uh, Perez, I think, can have a, a tough round with him. Um, so, I mean, I just think, I think it's going to be just like a super scrappy, difficult fight to score, to be honest. Yeah, I think it's certainly. I think it's just going to be. Um, oh, go on, sorry. Real like split decision kind of stuff. Uh huh. I can see that for sure. I, I think it's certainly a winnable fight uh, for Perez, especially if the uh, the approach to Johnny Eduardo was not just predicated on oh Eduardo only wants to counter punch and he's old and he'll get tired if I press him. If that mm-hmm. actually represents like a real stylistic shift uh, of Perez becoming a more aggressive fighter then I think this is the case in literally 98% of MMA fights. But if he can back Martinez up consistently, uh, it's it sort of becomes his fight to lose. Because uh, Martinez, um, as dangerous as he can be if you just let him sort of march forward, is not good, really, off the back foot. And, mm. you know, and there are also opportunities, as you said, he's very counterable. Uh, Perez, not a bad counterpuncher. And that that means a lot of opportunities to sort of do, um, you know, what uh, Moicano did to uh, Hernandez last weekend to just use a counter and leverage that into at least a burst of pressure and uh, and make something happen, which I think, again, is not just an opportunity for punches, but also uh, Perez is a pretty capable level change wrestler. And uh, Martinez is very Mm -hmm. upright. So, yeah, yeah. I'm just I'm I'm just expecting like I I'm I don't really have a hard You know what? I'm going to agree with you. Who's going to win? Yeah, I'm I'm actually going to flip-flop and agree with you. Having looked at it that way, um it is very much it's ba- based on the idea that Perez fights this correctly, which I I still don't entirely trust him. But uh, I I liked how he approached the Eduardo fight. He he looked really determined and aggressive and I think he can he's 
Yeah, in that context, maybe a little just better in the pocket than Martinez, a little more consistent, a little better connecting his defense to his offense and then going back to his defense. Whereas Martinez, it's really just high guard punch and then sometimes forget about the high guard and scur- yeah. and scurry backwards. So, okay. You've swayed me or at least talked me into swaying myself. Um Let's take, hey, let's take such an important fight as well. <laughs> it is an interesting one, you know, uh, and I think per- Perez could you can't really go wrong with bantamweight. Yeah. And Perez could easily become a pet favorite fighter of mine if um, this is a new direction for him going forward, because he's, you know, he looked really scrappy and he's he's got that sort of perennial underdog thing, especially in a division like bantamweight. I would love to see him scrape out some really rough, uh, aggressive wins the way he did against Eduardo. So let's go yeah, Alejandro. I mean, I the other one, the other one to mention was, uh, his fight against Matthew Lopez, which true, but was good. Like it was, a mm-hmm. again, it was like a, it was a scrappy fight where he got into tons of trouble Then uh, he pulled it out with a, a weird finish. Yeah. Um, it was, yeah, it wasn't, he, he, he counter punched a lot, but it wasn't an, like an, wasn't a, a a passive performance. Yeah, I, I think he's a he's a good he's a good like measuring stick for the division, and he, he could be more than that with a little more um a little more pop. I agree. All right, one more break then. When we come back, Walker Hill, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Financial support is fantastic, but there are other, even easier ways to support Heavy Hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are. But no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. You can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve. So thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. All right, welcome back to Heavy Hands. We spent the last half hour talking about video games and uh, and, and books and uh, boutique pornography and really anything. Anything to stave off talking about i'm actually joking because this gives me a talking about jamal hill versus johnny walker gives us a a not rare but precious all the same opportunity to, to shit on john kavanaugh so um the the opportunities are increasingly not rare <laughs> increasingly common and yet it's like a chipotle burrito you know i had one yesterday i could eat another one today you know it's never really bad <laughs> um, so yeah johnny walker the question was um was the fight with tiago santos an anomaly was it a growing pains kind of thing trying to change his style and uh, i'm gonna go ahead and say no no it's just that he has uh arguably he's not gotten better in any noticeable way um but has changed his style which has made his win his Chances of winning any fight, uh, I, I would say, considerably worse. Does that sound about right, Phil? Dead air, Phil? Yeah. That's about right. <laughs> um, he's... Yeah, you know, it, it is one thing to be a giant, very impressive athlete. You do... Even at light heavyweight, you do sort of have to have a skill set. Yeah, you have to have something where you're like, this is what this guy is good at. And Johnny Walker, he he just doesn't have a skill set. Like, he's not a good wrestler, he's not a good grappler, and he's not a good striker. And he's not super durable. Ooh. So even, I mean, that was already a major flaw in his previous style, which was just mayhem. But you, it's got to be said at this point, mayhem took far better advantage of his uh, lacking skills but overwhelming physicality than whatever this is. Yeah. 
You know, the absence. Tough one for John. And now it's now it's useless mayhem. Like there's still as much messiness there, but now it's messiness that the opponent uh, gets to figure out rather than having to deal with. If that makes sense. Yeah, of course. Like, uh, we'll watch this fight again. It, it, it won't take you long. Johnny Walker trying to move around on the outside crosses his feet at least a dozen times. Uh, when he's not really that far out of range or out of range at all. He, like, this is a guy who has, as far as I can tell, been coached into a more, uh, quote unquote, safe style, uh, for which he has none of the requisite technique. Not even the basics of footwork. Like, it, it seems as if, whether it was his decision or his that the the the, the new team has not um, has not like countermanded in any way, or it is a decision in part made by his new team, they they and they've not made him better in any way. They've just said fight differently in a way that is in fact worse. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean it's pretty sad I, I, in some ways because we've got a soft. I think even though you don't like Johnny Walker, I think we still have a soft spot for meme fighters who can turn things around. Sure. It's it's just genuinely hard to see him turning around it around despite all the obvious physical gifts. I mean, as I said, he's very athletic. He's humongous. Mm-hmm. I was genuinely shocked at how small Jamal Hill looked next to him. Yeah, Jamal Hill's not a small light heavyweight. Oh. Um, but yeah, he's, he's, just, he's just not good anywhere, and they told him that he should be not good from far away. Yeah. And it didn't work again. Um, didn't really think Jamal Hill looked great either. No, no, but at least he came forward. Yeah, he came forward. Um, I got, got picked a few times and then uh, just like deaded walker in one exchange it didn't make me think wow the future of light heavyweight has arrived no 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 um but other than that this was a weirdly fun card i do agree it wasn't mm-hmm. it wasn't booked as anything particularly fantastic but um just like a, a lot of oh in a weirdly fun card in in kind of two ways in the a it was like a lot a lot of finishes where you, i didn't expect Finishes, but also, like, I didn't expect finishes, even the dynamics of the fight. I'm going to be honest, there were a lot of these fights where something was happening. I was like, oh well, this fight has taken a turn for the X, and I hit fast forward, and then the next time, like, I pressed play, the fight was obviously over. Yeah, something very different had happened in the interim. <laughs> yeah, like, a lot of them. Um, not ashamed to say I started fast forwarding. Um, uh, Stephanie Egger, Jessica Rose Clark. The minute uh, Jesse Jess started driving her forehead, oh, into, see uh, that is one where I disagree uh, because um, I'm not going to trash Jesse Jess here, but uh, nor her. It's coach. almost like someone taught her how to be a lay and pray artist, Connor. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to go ahead and say that me and her coach were in line in thinking that. You shouldn't hang out in the clinch. It's it's Stephanie Eggers one reliable avenue to like decisively winning a fight. Uh I think that was just basically bad instincts and Jessica Rose Clark just uh not thinking. It's cool that you can that, that like women's bantamweight has evolved to a point where people are rushing into the clinch getting uh Outside reaps into a scarf hold armbar again. Oh. It's like, oh, <laughs> back here. It wasn't technically a head and arm throw, so I'll consider that a step up. It was a, <laughs> a Harai Goshi with overhooks, yeah. which is a thing that I definitely did point out Stephanie Egger likes to do. Um, so don't blame me. That's all I'm saying. Other people looking for scouting work, A, be prepared to wait four weeks. <laughs> And B, <laughs> that wasn't my fault. Um, uh, but yeah, like Chas Skelly. Mm-hmm. Um, so David Onama, I think, was probably the, is probably the most 
cool thing to come out of this card. Yeah, I actually I do want to talk very briefly of every fight through Miller and Onama, Miller Moda and Onama Benitez. So let's let's do that that featured prelim fight first. Um, in the simplest of terms, it was pretty much the fight that Benitez had with uh, Yusuf. Z- not God, I did this last time. Yusuf Zalal. Um, and they're such similar fighters. <laughs> it's just the name Yusuf, uh, Sadiq Yusuf. Very similar. He, um, you know, Benitez was really just styling on Anama uh, for pretty much the entirety of the fight until he wasn't. I uh, I don't know that I saw uh, much growth out of Onama in that, which does give me slight worries because, like, I don't think, you know, it was a youth win. It was a toughness, durability, athleticism kind of win. Like, just like with Sadiq Youssef, I, I think you'd be a little too optimistic to look at a win like like the one that uh, Yusuf had over Benitez and be like, you know, at the time I was. I was like, oh, man, that, that's a great win. Look at the toughness he showed. And he went through. It was starting really tough. I like to see that. And then it turns out that, like, uh, against guys where that's not enough, he's, he's, he just is kind of as limited as he was in the, in the early stages of that fight. Same with Onama here. This wasn't, you know, after the, the potential we saw in that, that debut against Mason Jones, um, I don't think he did anything particularly clever to stop Benitez. But it's also the fact that it's just two straight fights where the thing which is really impressing you about this guy is his incredible toughness. Yeah, right. You know, like, don't become action fighter Darren Elkins for this division. Yeah. But it's bad for your development and your health yeah and certainly it means that you know probably for some time he's going to be in some uh unfailingly exciting matchups but um, because that's the thing i think they will now put him in yeah these kind of matchups again and again and i would love Whereas to see I think him. it's it's fairly clear he needs some development time yeah exactly that's that's my feeling exactly um, you know, as for Benitez, looked great, man. All the reasons I love him. Mm-hmm. Slipping and countering, hitting the body ruthlessly, firing off his low kicks, lateral movement, looking good. And then just got to run into the fence and hit with like 12 punches in a row. Oops, you know, got stung, that was it. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing about the use of fight is that like when three people in his last five fights have been able to do this. Yep. Uh, you're just like, oh, yeah, it's, it's just possible to do that to Gabriel Benitez. Yep. Run him backwards, overwhelm him, sort of, you know. Not to not to paint him with the same brush I, I, I painted Alejandro Perez with before, but just, you you know, if you're if you're young and tough enough and hit hard enough, then you, you can, to an extent, ignore Benitez's success, and he's not that tough. So mentally very tough, but he's not going to be able to take your shots. Yes, time to give Anama some less, some less dynamic competition, I yeah, think. Yeah, probably not going to happen, especially not at Featherweight, but I totally agree that would be the right move because he looks like he's got a lot of potential if uh, if taken care of correctly. Um, okay, so let's talk uh, Jim Miller Moda, and then we'll talk about Joaquin Buckley. Um, this was awesome for Jim Miller. I thought Nicholas Moda had exactly the wrong approach. So... He kind of gave it. <laughs> he kind of just gave it to Jim Miller, in my opinion. Yeah, it was a cool. It was a cool example of how like range and speed aren't necessarily enough. Mm-hmm. As Mota clearly had just a massive and speed advantage, and it's also just you know you're taller than than Jim Miller. And it was just cool to see, like, Jim Miller gradually take that away. Mm-hmm. And then, like, pull him into a, a, a crafty punch and finish the fight. Great. Uh, but, yes, it was, like, it was strategically uh, incredibly lacking in the same way as, like, uh, it, it was like it was like uh, Matt Brown against What's-His-Face. 
Matt Brown against what's his face? Um, uh, Miguel Baeza. Oh yes. Is that the you know the prospect was just like if I keep running my game, will eventually work. Mm-hmm. In the you know in the Matt Brown case, it kind of did. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in this one, it was just you could see it getting prized apart from the beginning. Yeah. There was just no change to it. It was just his leg getting chewed up, punches getting closer and closer and closer, and then it was it. Yeah, and I think the big difference there is that, like, Matt Brown, at this point in his career, both he and Miller, as old fighters tend to, don't have the stamina they used to. Hmm. Um, And uh, Matt Brown, like, given a chance to come forward, will, like, destroy himself. Um. Main, you know, pushing a pace that he can't maintain. Jim Miller, given the chance to come forward, I think can do it competently for three rounds straight with no problem. He's a lot more considered and patient and will fight in bursts. And the the fights in which Jim Miller gasses out are ones where he is made to fight at a pace. He will not willingly exhaust himself. And uh, that is why taking the back foot and trying to counter him, even if, yes, Moda had some good success doing that early, uh, is a bad idea for a number of reasons. You know, because on the flip side, Miller is just historically not that great against pressure. And especially, yeah, pressure and reach. Pressure and reach and really needs to be like uh, uh, himself pretty effective coming forward, but needs to be you need to demand that Jim Miller comes forward for him to do it. So even if you just stand your ground, you are likely to get a fight out of Jim Miller in which he does not insist on backing you up. That has happened countless times, like, say, against Anthony Pettis. Hmm. And um, so, yeah, Moto basically, like, every single exchange, every feint, showed that he was willing to step back and, and was trying to draw Miller in. And this gave a super crafty veteran in Miller... Lots of time. A, it allowed him to to manage his energy, and it gave him lots of time to figure out the strikes that worked best. And before the uh, right hook, which was really well chosen, as you said, a crafty punch um, set up off of the expected counter right from Moda. Um, before that, it was the low kicks. Another thing that Miller is just going to destroy you with if you give him the time and space to do it. And uh, yep. Good win for Jim Miller. Love to see him still doing it. But, uh, yeah, Moda probably could have won that fight. I mean, it was a good learning opportunity for him. Sure. Uh, as I said, hand speed looked good. Uh, just give you the bright lights a bit much for him. Yeah. Um, all right. What about Joaquin Buckley, Abdul Razak Al Hassan? This was not the fight I expected. <laughs> what a weird fucking fight. <laughs> this is. Sort of the fight I expected, and that Buckley looking a, a, a bit a bit of a step behind early, um, in a forcing a hard fight on Al Hassan, and then, um, you know, also I, I was not really surprised to see Buckley like trying to be a little quote unquote craftier. You know, he is unfortunately becoming technical, which uh, which means moving around a lot more. Uh, without any necessarily clear idea of why he's doing it or what it's supposed to lead to, still incapable of like varying the tempo, the rhythm, uh, the intensity of his strikes. So if you once he does get into range, if you've you've got the stones for it, you can time him. And then getting out tired and out wrestled by Abdul Razak Al Hassan in the end. That was a surprise. <laughs> I did not it was see. So weird. Very strange. Um, the you know I, I said on Twitter like a like one of the shockers being that practically every fight on this card got finished apart from this one. Yeah, right. I mean Joaquin Buckley and Abdul Razak Al Hassan. Yeah, uh, Al Hassan winning the last round off takedowns and top control. Yeah. Was, the weird feeling that, like, Buckley had a limited pool of, like, smart fight adjustment points he could spend. Yes. He had to take them away from his 
had to take them away from like his strike selection pool to put them into the takedown pool. Yes. Leading to all those moments where um, Al Hassan was like cowering, <laughs> visibly gassed out against the fence with uh, both his forearms up, and Buckley just endlessly punching his forearms oh. while he just go punch him in the body. Yeah. He sent a few body shots in, far too little and far too late, and after wasting tons of energy. And by the way, it also wouldn't have been a shock if he got like, if like what happened to Ryan Bader against Glover Teixeira happened here. Mm-hmm. Because the, the thing with Buckley is that you can time him. He's, he's metronomic when he's putting a combination together. And the, a way to deal with that, I mean, A, learn to take a ste- some steam off a punch and throw it with no power. That's what you do when a guy has his guard up, by the way. You throw the bullshit at his guard to keep it up, and then you tear through the body. You, you put all that Joaquin Buckley power and force into the body shots. But also, yeah, just like firing shots that the guy is mostly easily defending because you're targeting the one thing that he is focused on defending um, with a predictable rhythm. I was really expecting, uh, half expecting Al Hassan to just f- rip off a big counter and crack Buckley uh, for fighting so foolishly. And what was he other did way? try it a couple of times? Yeah, I yeah. Think might have it might have even worked once or twice, but a couple times, yeah. And Buckley, you know, showed durability, which is good. He he showed uh, some awareness of that. There were several instances too where he did pull back at the right time. He anticipated the counter coming. But not a smart performance from Joaquin, and uh, I don't want to blame the, uh, the the Detroit whatever street defense guy who clearly just like paid to be in Joaquin Buckley's corner, <laughs> and yeah. to his credit, mostly just shut up um, and and didn't like try to contribute. He didn't go like full Seagal and think that he was having some massive impact on what was happening. Uh, I'm not going to blame him. I, I think Buckley, you know, some credit for trying to do things a little differently, but you're right. There was this bizarre feeling that in trying to adjust, the elements of his game that were already strengths just got stupider and weaker. He, that, I mean, he's always been like a decent body puncher. Yeah. And he was offered someone up against the ca- the cage with their arms up. Yeah. He was famous for gassing out in the third round. Yeah. And declined the opportunity on so many occasions that he exhausted himself. Yeah. And was then out cardioed by Abdul Razak Al Hassan. Yeah. I on on the Vivi last week there was a this fighter Jesse Strader on the prelims. Very fun fight he had with Chad Ann Helliger, by the way. Um and I said that he was like uh he was like a basically a less sophisticated Joaquin Buckley. He kind of looked like the better Joaquin Buckley on this card. He he hit the body a lot uh, in his fight, and it had a great impact, and it, it was super consistent. And you know, I guess he's got marginally worse defense than Buckley, but that's I don't know, man. Strange performance from Joaquin. I guess he got the win. I just remember Buckley making... I can't remember exactly what they were, but he just made some really weird grappling decisions against uh, Hassan as well. Yeah. Like, just in that third round, just his... He, he just makes... Like, don't know if this is going to go away. I think Joaquin Buckley just makes weird decisions on de- on defense. Yeah. And I think it's always going. There's always just going to be a possibility of him of him imploding. This is the definitely the weirdest way that he's imploded so far. I actually thought this fight was a draw. Yeah, yeah, that seems about right. Because he got smashed in the third round. Yeah, I thought he edged the first round. Nothing really happened in it. Mm-hmm. He was at least trying to do stuff. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, and he won the second round pretty easily, and then yeah, he just got obliterated in the third. Um. Yeah, concerning. Yeah, I agree. That's so easily solvable. Easily solvable. I think Buckley, like my my read on him, has been uh, the, the the you know there's always uh, every anything can be split broadly into two kinds of groups. And for fighters, one of those distinctions is thinker versus doer. Buckley's a doer. Yeah. He's a very rote fighter, and ideally, 
that kind of fighter can, when equipped with the right game plan, go in there and just do it. So ideally, Buckley is is still a kind of fighter who, like with different coaches or different preparation, uh, could go in there and execute really well. But I think the preparation had to have been off for this. He he tried to make some kind of change that didn't seem necessarily very relevant to to beating Al Hassan, and as a result, um, a as you said, I think that's connected to him making bad defensive decisions. Like when you put Buckley in a position where he has to think and improvise on the fly, he's often going to guess wrong. Um, but yeah, it just seemed to uh, diminish the areas of his game that were already obvious strengths in a matchup like this. You should have been winning this fight every moment after round one. That was a given coming in. Well, this is this is one of the problems I think. If he's a he is a doer, the way for these people to generally improve is to just be at a consistent good camp. Yeah, and you know just have good practices layered into them over and over, and for them to just drill them until they're second nature kind of thing. Right. Uh, but he is you know notoriously a bit of a gym nomad and a bit of a gym bully who. Yeah. goes too hard in training and doesn't have anywhere that he settles into. So I think, unfortunately, it is looking like he's going to be a coherent mess for the the foreseeable. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. All right, well, I think that's enough for this card, unless there's anything else you wanted to mention. Uh, no, I mean, well, I will say, uh, if Chas Kelly has retired... Mm-hmm. Uh, enjoyed his fights. They had this kind of same uh, sweaty wild man Yes, <laughs> of us is going to get super tired. Who's it going to be? Energy. Uh-huh. Um, but like a, just like this weird clunky dynamism to Chaz Skelly as well. Where Agreed. Like, you'd get strange finishes out of nowhere. It's a good time. Yeah, I've always enjoyed Chaz He did Skelly's that this time fights. as well. Absolutely. They're all kind of the same. You get crazy dynamic grappling, and then you get some striking, which like really looks like it shouldn't be working, but does a surprising amount of the time. Mm. Weird swings. He's, he's a great example on the feet of a uh, right ideas, wrong execution, right ideas kind of fighter. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to see him go out on a win and a typically exciting one. And as uh, Zane was saying last week, uh, it is a little disappointing that just like – so much of what probably could have been Chaz Skelly's prime was waylaid by constant injuries. I mean, this was his first fight since September of 2019. Um, but a, a very good and, and classically Chaz Skelly way to go out. So I hope he sticks to that decision and stays retired. It was a good one. And that's it, folks. Phil, thanks for coming back. Thanks for bringing your unnerving silences back to the show at this time i'm not gonna ju- i'm not gonna do it <laughs> too easy I was, I was thinking yeah <laughs> too easy staying in a lizard like <laughs> silence as you as you like steadily run out of steam he's a master of dead air talk. but he's also a contrarian he, do- <laughs> he, do- he <laughs> doesn't want to do what you expect him to do and that's why we love him uh good to have you back very good to hear that you're healthy uh, people who want to say things to Phil and experience the social media version of Dead Air can do that by finding him at Evil Greg Jackson. And you can find me, that's on Twitter.com, by the way, where you can also find me at Boxing Bush. Um, make sure you check out the Heavy Hands Patreon. Uh, last week, uh, I hope you all, people seem to enjoy having Zane on the show, as did I. And in addition to spending like an hour and 45 minutes, um, somehow outdoing me and Phil easily for our outrageously overlong episodes. He then went on to talk for 50 further minutes about the uh, UFC 271 undercard, and we had a good time. You can find that discussion on the Heavy Hands Patreon for $3 a month. And we'll talk to you next week. We've got uh, Covington uh, versus Masvidal coming up, which I don't care about particularly. Um, I think it's an interesting fight. It's it just is. Not really a, it's not really a main event, but I mean, it, it is a main event. They yeah. have to make it a main event, but uh, 
It's um, it, it's it's not a main event unless you're really into UFC quote unquote storylines. Yeah, that's why it doesn't interest me. I just, I mean, I find both of these guys more annoying than I do compelling at this point. But uh, it should be a good fight to watch. Uh, I think Phil, you've correctly pointed out many times, people tend to underrate Colby Covington as like, you know, an effective high level welterweight. I think there's plenty of reason to question uh like the quality of his wins but you can't deny that the guy gives tough matchups to a fighter as good as Kamara Usman and is reliably exciting and dogged and um it should be interesting to watch if not necessarily to think about we've also got uh RDA Fiziev has been rescheduled for the co-main event of that card Edson Barboza versus the famously good opinion having Bryce Mitchell Kevin Holland, Cowboy Oliveira. Um, For the time being, there is quite a lot to like about this card. Dustin Jacoby, Michael Oleksajuk is a light heavyweight fight made especially for me. (laughs) I really like that matchup, too. So we'll be looking forward to talking to you about that. That'll be next week. And until then, if you came here today for the finer points of face punching, you came to the right place. This has been Heavy Hands. Heavy Hands.